Thank you. I wanted to say thank you for everybody that was here. You guys are doing a great job. I don't know if you get told that very often, but you're the front line in America, and I appreciate you so much. I appreciate everybody that's here that's a little bit in the older crowd. The younger crowd is waking up, next generation. My question is, are you Muslim, sir? I'm an ex-Muslim. I'm an ex-Muslim. An ex-Muslim, okay. If anybody would like to answer this question who's a Muslim in the crowd, when Islam says that Jesus, if, if, if people say that Jesus was the son of God, kill them if they believe in it, and also that uh, he was never crucified, that somebody was put on the cross in his place, how can those, especially the first one, about killing someone if they believe that Jesus was the son of God, how can that be a religion of peace? And for you, since you recited that, I thought that maybe you were initially a Muslim. But is there anybody in the audience that's a Muslim and can tell me how Islam is a religion of peace if it preaches killing someone who believes that Jesus Christ was the Son of God? Uh, you, you can ask your question from the speakers, I guess. There's no, that's, Muslim, there's no Muslim up here. I, but I was a former Muslim, so if there's no mu Muslim to answer this. When I used to be a Muslim, I never, uh, the way we think about it, when I was a Muslim, I never thought calls on killing uh, non-Muslim were evil. Actually, we always, you know, Islam really makes your mind think differently from logical Western thinking. We can incorporate two opposite ideas at the same time and feel perfectly comfortable with it. For instance, we used to learn that Islam is a religion of peace. And at the same time, we, we, we didn't feel any conflict when we would say, but go kill the, Jew, the Jews. It, it, we never thought about it as, as co in, it conflicts the value system of logic. And this is the tragedy that most Muslims, the majority of Muslims have no clue about the religion analytically. To them, it's all emotion. It's, it's my father's religion, it's my, the only religion I can believe in, and it has to be right. We were told the Quran, word by word, was, was, was from God directly, and, uh, and the way they recite it is so rhythmic and so emotional that really it feels, uh, it feels uh, very, uh, ch chilling. I mean, until today, if you hear the men recite it, it's, it could, he could be saying in the recitation, kill the, kill the infidels. But it sounds so holy. Mm -hmm. So holiness and killing are not something, when you're a Muslim, they don't conflict with one another. It, it has become such a sick ideology that Muslims must wake up and examine, examine the religion, really examine the religion. But until today, they are not, they don't have the courage to do that. After the revolution in Egypt, I didn't see one, one person in Tahrir Square carrying a sign that says separation of mosque and state. Even though that they know very well that if they apply Sharia, they will never have a democracy. I'd like to add a bit to that about the peace by giving you a quick historical anecdote you might find useful, which is basically the word peace in Islam has an etymological connection to the word submit. And this is actually sort of the game that a lot of Muslims play. They say Islam means peace, and in a way it does. Uh, salam comes from the same root as Islam, which is uh, submit, which is the name of the religion. And it's a kind of a historical thing that Muhammad, according to Islamic tradition, used to send letters to the early Christian kings, for instance, in Egypt and in Constantinople. And he would say, Eslam Teslam. And basically what that means is submit, have peace. And so there's a corollary between submitting, which of course brings about a lot of violence and bloodshed and killing, and then that leads to peace. And so that's why going back to your question, how is this religion of peace if you're out to kill people? The logic is that I'm out to kill them to create peace because they're so, um, you know, they're not cooperating. <laughs> they're the bad guys. So we, we have to break them and make them submit and then it's peace. Also remember, Islamic law is the law of Allah, who is the supreme God. And so it's perfect justice. 
So the idea is to establish the rule of Islamic law over the world, which is peace. And so you have to kill people on the way to that. That's not violence. That's justice. It's jihad. And so you have a lot of Muslims condemning terrorism. And then when you look at their statements more closely, they're condemning Israel and the United States. But not like the Twin Towers or the Fort Hood shootings or something like that. Because those things aren't terrorism. They're justice in the service of peace. If I may just start with a comment concerning President Obama's statement about uh, slander. Um, slander, libel, defamation of character have certain legal definitions behind them. To speak the truth about Muhammad is not to slander him. So I would be, as a Christian, in support of that statement that we shouldn't slander people. But his misunderstanding of Islam and the facts is what causes him to think that the truth is slander because the reality of Islam is so uh, unnatural and abhorrent to the Western culture. So I can understand somebody confusing the two. Well, also in Islamic law, there's a definition of slander that's different from that of American law. In Sharia, the definition of slander is telling something about someone that they don't want known. It could be true, but if they don't want it known and you tell it, that's slandering. So see, when I write a book about Muhammad and say this is what they say Muhammad said and did, that's slandering Muhammad because they don't want Westerners to know those things even if they're all true. It's even more comical, just to add to that, and it's based on something you just said, Nani, which is basically, like, as you do, I watch a lot of Arabic programs of these sheikhs and these Islamic clerks, and they'll say all the same things that if I say it, I'm a terrible human being. And the difference is they say it and they take pride in it. Mm -hmm. You okay, but <laughs> Uh, they, they say it and they take pride. Okay, so for instance, I'll see a program of um, an Islamic cleric saying it's okay to marry a girl. It really doesn't matter her age now. They've concluded six or nine is not the point, her age. The point is, can she bear the weight of the man? Therefore, if a five-year-old is a strong girl and can, then that's okay. And he'll say it and he's proud of it and he'll evoke the prophet of Islam. Okay, and there's no problem with that. He's a great sheikh. But if I say it, I'm saying it with a bit of criticism. I'm, we're, we're both stating the same thing, but it's exactly why am I saying it? I'm saying it to be critical. He's saying it and he's supporting it. Another Muslim clerk will, will come and say and complain about how if we really want to fix our economy, we need to do what Muhammad did, which is go on a jihad, raid people, steal their stuff, enslave them, and sell them in markets. And he'll get a loud, thunderous applause for that. But if I say it, and then I'm being critical and saying this is not how it should be, then I'm the bad guy. So it's a lot of it has to do with the value judgment, which is sort of something that's been conveyed here. For instance, Muhammad uh, had a, he used to, to tell people that the urine of the camel and his own urine would cure diseases. His, Muhammad's urine, okay, that's in, in some hadith. And today, in Egypt, because they're becoming so Islamist, there is a clinic that opened to sell camel urine because Muhammad said, said so. If I laugh at it and write an article criticizing it, I'm saying doing slander against Islam, even though they're doing it. So they are ashamed. I mean, come on, let's face it. What kind of religion uh, uh, you know, kills people who insult them? They, they must really don't have enough confidence in themselves. Islam is a religion that has the least confidence in itself. And that's why any little criticism rocks them. I mean, it, it goes crazy. Because they cannot answer you logically. They cannot defend themselves logically. So they resort to terror. The, and violence. The Quran itself says, O oh, you who believe, do not ask about things yeah. which if made plain to you will make you uncomfortable. And so even among so, Muslims, they, they say and they quote the don't Quran, ask, don't ask too many don't questions. Don't ask any questions. <laughs> believe in it as yeah. it is. And that's why when Muslims <clears throat> live in the Middle East, nobody criticizes Islam because it's a crime. But we come to America here and suddenly Americans are asking us questions very innocent questions, and we're just like, oh my God, how dare they ask us this question? We've never been asked this question in the Muslim world. You must hate Islam. You must be hating Islam. We're su you're supposed to accept what we tell you as is. <laughs> <laughs>
And that's why I left the religion. <laughs> Um, now, to follow that with the question, uh, for the layperson, seeing that there are so many sects within Islam themselves and different uh, divisions, how would you approach Muslims concerning the primary source materials and how would you reference them so that they carry some weight? Most of them don't know their religion. That's something I want to just alert you to. I, you're saying about different sects. Most Muslims are Muslims hardly ever read the Quran with try understanding. Different sects are just following each other. They hate each other just because they were told to hate each other. And really, you don't have to go too analytical, because if you know something, most probably a Muslim person doesn't know it. One, uh, one, one historical thing, um, a lot of Muslims, what do they want? They want a caliphate, right? And they always talk about the golden age of the caliphate and how wonderful Islam was and the world was and it was at peace. And the other day I was looking at the, uh, the Umayyad and the Abbasid <coughs> caliphates and amazingly the vast majority of the caliphs were all assassinated. Yeah. And usually when you have assassinations going on, that's an indication of turmoil and chaos. So even the golden age, quote unquote, that is their paradigm that they wish to instill and, and to bring about is itself full of bloodshed. Most people who have a mythical golden age, at least it's so, you know, it's utopic and uh, however hard it is to actually realize it. But even their golden age is full of bloodshed and killing and destruction. And, uh, and, and one final hadith, Muhammad himself said, in the end times there will be, I forget the number, something like 99 Islamic sects. And 72 Islamic sects. 72. Islamic and 71 will go to hell because only one's right. <laughs> So every, every sect one. thinks yeah. the other one is an infidel that should go to hell. Uh, since we are short of time, I would uh, appreciate it if uh, you avoid making statements and just ask short questions. Thank you. I have a two-part question. If President Obama says the slandering using the Muhammad's name, why we cannot say slandering when putting the cross in a urine and call it an art? Also defaming Mary or Jesus. It's a flagrant because, inconsistency. Because the that's Christians all. don't, don't uh, go and riot and kill and burn. Yeah. We're cowards. We're basically cowards. That's why we, we give too much respect to... No, no, but to, if Christians did yeah. riot and burn, yeah. Obama would have no problem slapping same, them down. Same. No, no, yeah. he would put them same. in jail and yeah. he would... Oh, yeah. and how dare you, this is, not, this is unacceptable. Yeah. This is reserved for Muslims because mm -hmm. Muslims, you know, well, <laughs> we kinda kind of have to treat them the nicely pass. because they're so violent. That's the logical. <laughs> but Christians know better, so if you're violent, you go yeah. to jail. Yeah, oh yeah. We won't tolerate that. Okay, <clears throat> second part. If I say Jesus Christ is the only way to God, not Muhammad, is it a slandering or is it a hate crime? Don't take it in front yeah. of a Muslim. You go to jail in Pakistan for saying that it could be lynched by a mob. This is how they victimize Christians in Pakistan. Talk about here. You know that. Well, it's getting to be that way here. This is the thing that we're talking about free speech tonight. And if we want to look at what that would look like, we can look at the Section 295C of the laws of Pakistan and see how it's applied in Pakistani society. And I'm sure you're well aware that uh, <clears throat> Christians are routinely victimized by the blasphemy laws in Pakistan. And that's exactly the law that they want to bring to the United States. And it's exactly the case where a Muslim who wants uh, the land that a Christian owns or his car or something that he's got, he goes and he says, do you believe Muhammad is a prophet? And the Christian says, I don't believe Muhammad is a prophet. He's accusing, he accuses him of blasphemy. The guy's arrested. If he's acquitted, then a mob kills him and the Muslim can take whatever it is property. of his property that he wants. This is the, the blasphemy laws in action. And so uh, that's what's coming. Don't be Watch a Christian in a Muslim in world and own a diamond uh, <laughs> store or <a> jewelry <laughs> store because you can be accused of blasphemy, shot, and, and robbed. Thank you. Um, the UN resolution that you mentioned in the beginning was 1618 or That's 1816. Right. Um, is there any way that can be undone? What would, what would be the necessary steps, if there are any, um, to have that uh, commitment you know, from the president withdrawn? Well, I guess the president could just withdraw it. I mean, we're not te technically bound at this point. This is the showdown I was mentioning that has to come 
whether we are going to hold ourselves bound to international laws that contradict the Constitution or whether the Constitution and that have been agreed to by the United States government and thus constitute treaties or whether the United States Constitution will trump them. And that has not yet been decided. But right now it would seem clear that if we had a president who affirmed the freedom of speech and said that there would be no law that would infringe upon the freedom of speech, then that would be enough to do it. The problem is we don't have a president like that. We're not going to have one for at least four years. And he could do a great deal of damage in the meantime. What policies would you like to see the Obama administration implement to improve freedom of speech here or even foreign policy to bring more stabilization to the Middle East? Mass resignations. <laughs> um, To in, in, in the talk that I gave earlier that Petraeus and General Allen had a chance to explain and defend the freedom of speech when Muslims started rioting and killing over the Quran burning or the Muhammad video or whatever the outrage du jour was. And they didn't. And this is what they ought to be doing. They ought to be explaining why the freedom of speech is so important and why even Afghanistan would benefit from having it. And even Pakistan and even Egypt and so on. Uh, they, they ought to be, I mean, we really ought to have been doing this for years. We instituted constitutions in Iraq and Afghanistan that affirmed Sharia as the highest law of the land. And that was all about, you know, we're all about the will of the people and democracy and so on. But what we could and should have done when we had the opportunity, and what I was saying at the time, was that we should have stood up for our own values and stood up for the oppressed Christian minorities and Hindu minorities and non-Muslim minorities in general in those countries and brought to those countries and anywhere else where we could, not militarily necessarily, but just how, as a society held as the highest values, equality of rights of all people before the law, including women, the freedom of speech, the freedom of conscience versus the death penalty for apostasy, and so on. And if we had affirmed those things and insisted that governments in those countries, if we were going to be propping them up militarily, would have to adopt those things, well, the situation would be very different today. There is another thing that I'm noticing uh, in the last few years since Obama took office, that our, our media and our educational system is making uh, any criticism of Islam almost a shameful thing. And we're feeling it. Uh, we are bringing up a whole generation of children in America who are uh, absorbing uh, and, and being shamed if they, if they criticize the ideology of Islam. And that's something very new to America. Intellectually yeah, and, paralyzed. And, and, yeah, and, and that's very scary because before the laws in America could change, like what the UN is de doing, trying to in influence us, we're bringing up a whole generation of Americans that in 20 years, they could accept a law that makes blasphemy of Islam uh, something because they are brought up on the idea that it's, it is such a shame, that it's so bad. Uh, we are bringing up a new generation. We're, we're going to be gone, but we're going to live in America that, that, that is going to be a culture of pride and shame, which is typical. The co Arab culture is a culture of pride and shame. That's how they get you, by shaming you to death when you're a child and then putting you high up on a pedestal when, it's chi when you're a child if you say, I hate Jews. And when you're a child and you're rewarded heavily if you hate Jews and you are uh, treated like a villain if, if, you, uh, uh, if you just say that, slightest question about Islam, then we, we, you bring up a generation that will, will accept oppression. We're very close to this. People don't realize close. how close we We're are. We're very close because the Muhammad movie. We are not going to be second. alive. We're the Muhammad be, movie yeah. actually, there were calls in the Los Angeles Times and in the New York Daily News and in other major newspapers, calls for restrictions on the freedom of speech to make it impossible for such a movie to be made. Yeah. yeah. And th that's absolutely abominable that not only is it coming from the top, but coming from the mainstream media as well. And uh, there, the, I don't see how the freedom of speech is going to survive unless there is some major movement against this now. Who's America that? has its first Who's political prisoner. Are you sure? The man who did the movie, Wake Up America, he's in jail now. He's in jail for a year for violating some, something in his. We have our first 
political prisoner for blasphemy of Islam in America today. <clears throat>